Welcome to our uh, webinar on non-DOM uh, tax regimes uh, throughout Europe. Uh, we have a distinguished panel of guests today with us. We're going to talk about Malta, Portugal, Cyprus, Italy, and the UK. Uh, just to get some issues out of the way, uh, you can submit questions to us, to our audience, using the control panel. We are recording this, um, this webinar, and we're also going to have a full transcript available to everyone. That should be ready within a couple weeks. Uh, with that said, let me introduce Dimitri, who will be our moderator. Uh, who's been extremely patient with us uh, this morning with all these technical difficulties. Uh, in any case, uh, Dimitri Zappel is an international tax and business advisor with practical knowledge of the principles of individual and corporate international taxation and cross-border business planning. He joined IFS in September 2010 after earning his LLM tax degree at King's College London. Five years prior to this, Dimitri earned his LLB law at Durham University. Dimitri is a qualified Russian lawyer and prior to coming to the UK was an associate at Moscow City Bar Association Barshevskin Partners. Dimitri holds the Advanced Diploma in International Tax ADIT. With that said, uh, Dimitri, the floor is yours. I apologize one last time uh, for this uh, inconvenience and have a great discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Matteo. Uh, let's try better this time. <clears throat> I uh, would like, first of all, to introduce the speakers. Claudio Tobesco, law partners in, from Italy. Joa Figuera, Lunia, Portugal, Demis Ioano, Tax Atelier, Cyprus, Laszlo Kish, Discus Holdings, Malta, and myself, Dmitry Zapol, IFS Consultants from the UK. In today's discussion, we will consider the meaning of the term domicile and how it affects tax liabilities of individuals worldwide. Before I pass the floor to the speakers, let me tell you a bit about the concept of domicile which is a private law concept that the courts use to decide which legal system applies to a person when he or she has connections with more than one jurisdiction. In other words, domicile helps settle competing jurisdiction claims. Normally, it is relevant to personal law, such as marriage, divorce, wills, and succession or death. However, in certain circumstances, it determines a person's uh, tax liability. Out of the five countries we are discussing today, the UK has used the concept of domicile for the longest time to decide on one's tax liability. However, there are new contenders and the speakers will tell you more about their appropriate regimes. Without further ado, let me pass the floor to Claudio Todesco. Thank you, Claudio. Thank you, Dimitri, and uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, I will introduce the brand new Italian uh, resident dom uh, tax uh, regime. Uh, as I mentioned, it, this is a quite good, a quite uh, new uh, regime for the Italian environment. Uh, so basically, the Italian bill for 2017 has introduced a new optional regime for individuals who transfer their tax residence uh, in Italy. The tax authorities have provided the relevant rules for the application of the regime at the end of March. And on the last Tuesday, the tax authorities have provided further clarification regarding the application of the regime. So, starting from the tax year 2017, the regime excludes from taxation any income generated or produced abroad by an individual, irrespective of its financial transfer to uh, it, uh, which means that no remittance basis uh, uh, principle applies according to the regime. Furthermore, the application of the regime involves non-application of certain wealth taxes, non-application of uh, uh, tax monitoring obligation, and certain exclusion for inheritance and gift tax purposes. Following the application for the regime, the uh, individual has to pay an annual lump sum of 100,000 euro and he, she has the opportunity to extend the application of the regime of any family member who has to pay an annual lump sum of 25,000 euro. The application of the regime is valid for 15 years. It can be revoked uh, by the taxpayer or uh, automatically any time and uh, uh, after the revocation or after the termination it cannot be renewed. So the first question uh, going to deeper into the details is who may apply for the regime? 
So an individual, in order to be eligible for the uh, regime, has to jointly map, meet uh, two conditions. The first one is the transfer of the tax residence to uh, Italy. That according to Article uh, 2 of the Italian Consolidated Tax Act uh, involve the uh, verification if for the greater part of the year one, alternatively, one of the three following conditions uh, is met. The first condition is the registration in the register of uh, resident population, which is a pretty formal condition. The second one is the residence in Italy, which means the uh, physical presence in the, into the territory of Italy. The third one is the domicile in Italy. The uh, concept of domicile according to the Italian law and uh, clarification provided by the tax authority are, is very close to the concept of the center of vital interest included in the OECD model convention. As I mentioned before, the, uh, the regime can be extended to any family member of the individual. In that case, the, uh, any family member uh, has to meet the same condition as well. The extension can be a request even in an year following the first application. I was missing the second condition, sorry, uh, which is the uh, residence uh, in the 10-year period before the application for the regime. Uh, according to this condition, the individual has to have been resident uh, in Italy, the 10 period before the application of the regime, at maximum for one year. So, uh, going to the benefit uh, arising from the application of the regime, the first one is the exclusion from the section of any or individual income tax of any income generated or produced abroad irrespective of the financial transfer of that income to Italy. So, in case of transfer, financial transfer of the income generated abroad in Italy, they would not be subject to taxation in Italy in any case. Uh, however, uh, the, uh, those uh, income cannot benefit of any foreign tax credit for potential withholding tax applied abroad. And the Italian tax authorities have clarified that uh, rules provided for blacklist income or CFC rule does not, do not apply to uh, income generated abroad. The, uh, the taxpayer has uh, an additional opportunity, uh, uh, which is the, the potential exclusion of uh, one or more country from the application of the regime. This is a sort of cherry picking a principle according to which the uh, individual has the opportunity to uh, apply ordinary taxation to one or more country. In that case, uh, blacklist, blacklist rules, CFC rules and foreign tax credit rules would apply to the income generated in the excluded country. The application for the regime involves following uh, benefit, uh, that is, the non-application of wealth taxes applied to real estate properties located abroad and on financial assets held abroad, and the exclusion from the, monot from the tax monitoring obligation. These exclu those exclusions do not apply for countries excluded from the application of the regime. The last benefit is the exclusion from it and the inheritance tax uh, of assets and rights held abroad by the individual. The regime also uh, includes a, a sort of anti abuse uh, clause. Uh, that is, uh, during the first five years of application of the regime, capital gains arising from the disposal of qualifying shareholdings, and with qualifying uh, we mean uh, shareholdings more than 20% of the voting rights or 25% of companies' share capital. The threshold are reduced to 
2 and 5% in case of listed company. So in relation the, of the, uh, to these capital gains, uh, they are subject to ordinary taxation regime for the first five years of application of the regime. The option is valid for 15 years. It can be revoked anytime by the uh, individual or it can be revoked automatically, automatically in case of transfer of the tax residence of the individual abroad or in case on, of unpayment of the annual lump sum. Following the revocation or the expiration of the regime, it cannot be reviewed, renewed in any case. The last question is how to apply for the regime. So there are basically two uh, opportunities for, the, for an individual. The first one is a communication included in the annual income tax return referred to the year from which the individual wants to apply for the regime. So, in other words, if an individual wants to apply starting from the tax year 2017, he has or she has to make the communication in the income uh, annual income tax return for the 2017, which has to be filed with the revenue agency by the end of September of the following year, so 2018. The second opportunity is, the, is represented by the filing on, of an advance ruling with the tax authorities. In that case, the, uh, the individual, even before the transfer of the tax resident to Italy, has the opportunity to ascertain with the Italian tax authorities if whether the condition requested for the application of the resident uh, are met or not. The last point is the uh, annual lump sum, which is 100,000 euro for the individual and 25,000 euro for any relatives who apply for the region. Uh, the, those amounts are due by the end of, of the following year. Uh, that is, uh, uh, the annual lump sum due for 2017 will be due by the end of June 2018. I hope to have uh, clarified uh, all the points again. <laughs> Claudia, thank you very much for the summary. Very useful to know about this regime. Tell me, um, if the main applicant pays 100,000 euro, then, for example, his or her spouse would only pay 25,000 euro per year. And presumably both, both persons would be able to apply the regime to their respective income earned abroad, right? So they, yes. both can, they both can be earning income outside Italy, but only one of them would have to pay 25,000 to avoid taxation in Italy, right? Yeah, correct. And uh, on the other side, uh, any family members has the opportunity to uh, opt for the regime on, on an individual basis. Uh, this can be useful when, for example, uh, the son of an individual uh, as uh, opt for, opted for the regime in a following year, so let's say uh, 10 years after the first uh, uh, application by his uh, or her father. So uh, for five years he can opt as a family member and then he can opt as an individual for the following 10 years, so for 15 years as well. This is very useful to know and this seems to be a very simple regime. There's hardly any conditions that you have to fulfill in Italy. You just have to file your return, agree with the tax authorities, and as we say in London, Bob's your uncle. Um, the only disadvantage that I see here is that if you are not a portfolio shareholder for the first five years, you cannot sell your foreign gains uh, without paying Italian tax. We've seen situations where a person would leave a high tax country, such as the UK, realize their gains while abroad and then live happily ever after. But I guess anyone moving to Italy who is expecting to receive lump sum capital gain and a stream of income perhaps would be recommended to spend a year being not resident anywhere during which time he'd realize the capital gain and then would come to Italy, become resident there, etc. Uh, Claudio, yeah. thank you very much. Now I pass the floor to Joa. Uh, who will tell us about the Portuguese regime. Oh, yeah.
Thank you, Dimitri. Hello, everyone. <laughs> My name is João Figueira. I'll be talking about the Portuguese version of the resident non-domiciled. It's called uh, res, re, tax residency, but on, there's a variation. It's non-habitual tax residency. So here we have residents non-habitual. So it's replaced the non-domicile bit with non-habitual, but the effects are quite similar to a classic uh, residency slash domiciled uh, tax regime. So in this sense, a non-habitual resident, a non-habitual resident is, first things first, a tax resident of Portugal in the sense that that citizen can claim, that taxpayer can claim treaty relief and can claim residency in Portugal. Who can apply for, for, for the non habitual residency in Portugal? Any individual, Portuguese or foreign, foreigner, no limitations on nationality whatsoever, that has not been a resident of Portugal for the last five years. So it's, it can be someone that was a resident of Portugal, left for five years, for five fiscal years, and now wants to return. Upon his return to Portugal, or the first time he moves to Portugal, he must apply, and he must qualify as a tax resident. So first things first, he must enroll into the tax registry of Portugal as a resident taxpayer. Second, um, well, he also needs to meet one of the criteria for residency, which is pretty straightforward and pretty common all throughout the world, is either stay more than 183 days in Portugal, that triggers the residency in Portugal, tax residency in Portugal, so six months, or just hold a dwelling house uh, in Portugal, can either be a rental or, or can be owned by the individual, and that is all that suffices to get the tax residency in Portugal. So he is a tax resident, now he must apply for the non-habitual bit. So he must apply for the non-habitual tax residency. And now, he, and after that, that status is granted, that status is valid for 10 years, for 10 entire fiscal years up in the future. What, uh, of course, these 10 years are um, with it hasn't happened yet because it's this regime is fairly well it's not new but it's back from 2009 so only in two years time we will see how the renewals are made but I would say that renewals will be will be possible only after the individual leaves again for five years so I would say they are valid for ten years the individual has to leave Portugal for five years and then upon his return you'll get another 10-year uh, tax residency uh, under the specific type of non-habitual tax residency. How, however, uh, I would say that in, in comparison to other regimes, to other classic resident non-domicile regimes, there are no remittance uh, rules. So uh, this is a regime that, that, that I would say that reaches the same, the same purpose, which is somewhat a type of territorial tax, but it is, it is, it is achieved, this purpose is achieved in a, in a different manner. So what are the benefits for, for a non-habitual resident? A non-habitual resident is someone that, well, is not, well, most of his foreign source income is tax exempt in Portugal. So there is a comprehensive set of rules that are in coordination with our usual rules applicable to ordinary residents. But the fact is that most types of foreign source income are not, are not taxable in, in Portugal, are exempt from, actually in, from tax. And then, and then, because this regime was designed to attract not also investors or, or, or high net worth individuals, but also designed to attract um, professionals that have what we call high value added activities, there is also a set of rules that is applicable to earned income, to salaries, self-employment income in Portugal, where there's a list of, 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 of activities, let's say, for instance, architects, auditors, uh, IT consultants, college professors, singers, tax consultants too, 
um, they they are entitled to have a, a tax a flat tax of twenty percent if it's paid from a Portuguese source. It's a, it's a flat tax, so there will be no progressivity. There is no progressive tax on this income. However, and this is applicable to salaries too, most of them can be exempt if they are taxed at source. So it's not, it's not a rule that says strictly that foreign sourced income are exempt. No, this regime has um, requires a coordination with tax treaties of, signed by Portugal, which are approximately uh, almost 80. So the rule is, so as long as it can be taxed at source, Portugal will exempt the income. And, and this is applicable, as we know, for those who, who are in the tax business. It's, it's fairly common for dividends, interest, royalties, and rental income, uh, let's say capital gains on the sale of, of, of property, to be taxed at source. So this makes Joel, this, let's just ask you, yes. Let me just ask a question, Joe. So if yeah. you are receiving dividends from a source which does not impose withholding tax, then what do you do? Because presumably it's taxed at source, but it's not subject to tax. It's exempt. The rule clearly states that if the this type of income, and we have a, a scheduler type of income, so we divide into categories. So dividends, let's say if dividends are liable to tax according to the treaty, they are exempt in Portugal. As we know, there are a lot of jurisdictions that signed, that signed uh, treaties where the, the treaty allows for withholding tax to be levied, but the, the domestic provisions do not uh, foresee that taxation or just waive that taxation. It's, it's a fiscal policy uh, issue here, but the fact is that Portugal will exempt it. And there, there is no anti-abuse provision to tackle that because it's, it's a, it's, it is a straightforward uh, case. So as long as it can be taxed at source, can be according to the treaty, Portugal will exempt it. So what happens if you're receiving dividends with a country which does not have a treaty with Portugal? Say we're talking about not a true uh, offshore, but say Jersey, which many countries regard as offshores, but it's not really an offshore. What would happen well, to dividends received from Jersey? That's a good question because so as long there is a tax treaty, we know that there will be no tax here. However, Portugal even though it has more, more than 79 treaties, I think. The fact is, with some blacklisted jurisdictions, because we do have a blacklist, there is no treaty. In those cases, in those cases, there will be no exemption. And the fact is that it can trigger a 35% tax rate, which is an aggravated tax rate for income paid from blacklisted jurisdictions. So it's, 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 it's strange in the sense that in some situations, because of the regime, it will be fully exempt, but absent of a treaty, it will trigger a 35% tax rate. So uh, it's so either a, ba a bad scenario or a very good one. If I hold my investment in an offshore entity, which does not, which is in the blacklist, or is in a country which does not have a tax treaty with Portugal, presumably I can insert a treaty country on top, which does not impose any tax and then uh, bring any income to Portugal. Of course, subject to uh, uh, beneficial ownership issues in the country where the income is ultimately sourced. Okay. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. exactly. This, is, this, this, is, this is true. This is true. This can be achieved by interposing a, a, um, a company that pays a dividend with a country that Portugal has a tax treaty with. I would say also that even if Portugal doesn't have a tax treaty with that country, the regime can be also applicable, the exemption itself can be applicable if it's not the blacklisted jurisdiction. And Portugal in that case will, will resort, will use the provisions of the OECD model convention as if Portugal would have a treaty with that country, which is of course must not be a blacklisted jurisdiction, but it will resort to the, to the model convention uh, rules to determine whether or not hypothetically there would be tax at source. So if there is tax at source according to the model convention uh, and it's not a blacklist jurisdiction, it will be exempt in Portugal. So, the, well, the, this, these are the good things. The bad things 
are relate to capital gains on the sale of securities because this, this regime is a regime based on the interaction between the Portuguese domestic provisions and the tax treaties. And we know that taxation of, of, of capital gains on the sale of securities, shares, bonds, at source is something that is uh, unusual, to say the least. So Portugal, because Portugal does have a rule that if it's taxed at source, it will be exempt. But the fact is no one taxes this at source, nor the conventions foresee for taxation of, of capital gains on the sale of shares at source, Portugal will have to tax it, and we're talking about a 28% tax rate. So the, an overview of the regime would be most types of income are exempt so as long as they're paid by a foreign source, and according to a treaty, it can be taxed at source. Salaries, however, must be tax at source, must be. In fact, the, the taxpayer needs to pay some type of income tax at source to be exempt in Portugal. Anything that is paid into Portugal will not be exempt. However, if it is a high-value-added activity, there is a flat tax of 20%. On the other hand, if we're talking about Portuguese source dividends, interest, and royalties, we're talking about a 28% tax rate. So it's really the, the, the effects uh, of, of the non-habitual tax residency are similar to resident non-domicile regime. There is no remittance rules here. You can bring the cash into Portugal, valid for 10 years. However, where, where the, the, the issue lies in the, is in the, the, the capital gains, which will be taxed. And I'm just saying capital gains on the sale of shares, bonds, and other securities, not on the sale of property. That would be taxed at source, will be exempt in Portugal. So, the, so this is our, these are the benefits. Uh, in terms of inheritance tax, those same rules apply. So, so as long as there are, the, the inheritance uh, takes place between close relatives, it will be exempt. And Portugal doesn't have an inheritance tax per se. It does have uh, some provisions in stamp duty code that tax gifts and, and donations and everything that is uh, simulated to the concept of the donations such as inheritance. In those situations, uh, it will it will be taxable if the, 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 the transaction doesn't take place between close relatives. And Portugal will not ta try to tax any donation outside of Portugal because stamp duty is also territorial. So in recap, let's say that there is no inheritance tax in Portugal, nor gift, gift tax. If the, if the donations of the, if the, the state is passed on between close relatives. Um, more um, another question here would be uh, anti-abuse provisions. So the non-habitual tax residency does not have any specific types, any specific types of of anti-abuse provisions. So anti-abuse provisions such as CFC, etc., will apply. However, I would say that in most cases, you you well in all cases really you need to disclose the income, even though if it's exempt, for the regime to apply. So this is a fairly common question that people ask. So if it's exempt, uh, should I should I not should I not file it file for taxes? No, you should file for taxes, and you should also um, disclose the income even if it's exempt. The regime itself ends when you cancel your tax residency in Portugal. So even even if it's valid for ten years, just cancel the regime and move on to another country or. If the 10 years elapse, you will become an ordinary resident, which doesn't have the benefits of the tax of an unhabitual tax residence. So I would say this is the, the highlights of the regime, Dimitri. John, thank you very much for the summary. As I understood from what you were saying, it's a good regime for those who know that, for example, they are receiving dividends from all over the world and they're happy to combine their non-tax status on foreign dividends together with a good life in Portugal. It's not perhaps so good for those who want to leave a high-tax country and sell their shares in that high-tax high tax country. However, exactly. presumably, you could perhaps do the share-for-share -share exchange and convert the uh, capital gains into dividends. Into which, dividends. In, into dividends, which in the absence of anti-abuse in Portugal could perhaps exclude such dividend from, uh, from uh, tax in Portugal. I'm just thinking that quite a few of our clients have had to change 
their blacklisted jurisdictions to the white listed jurisdictions. But perhaps it's a journey worth taking. Thanks very much for your presentation. Now no I'm uh, passing the floor to Laszlo Kish, who will tell us about Malta. Please, Laszlo. Thank you, Dmitry. I'm happy to be here. Good morning to everyone listening to us. Um, first of all, let me say something about Malta, which is definitely the Maltese model of non-dom system is based on the UK model. When Malta became independent in 1954, the whole concept was fully accepted, which means that um, from that point, Malta could be called as partly the equivalent of the UK non-DOM system. And therefore, quite a lot of the definitions are not defined in the tax laws or other regulations because they all rely on the UK interpretation of those rules. That's why, for example, that the term of domicile is not, really not actually defined in the Income Tax Act. But the Inland Revenue um, considers an individual's domicile uh, the same way as the United Kingdom uh, tax authorities are doing that, which is the place where the person would like to return to die, maybe marriage, ties to the, uh, where the ties of the society of the strongest and so on. So just the usual domicile definition would apply to Malta also. Um, the definition also obviously uh, uh, defines where the person's residence in Malta as a person who uh, resides in Malta except for such temporary absences as the inland revenue made him reasonable and not consistent with the claim of such individual to be resident in Malta. So anyone who takes up normal residency there would be considered a resident, but if they can show uh, the ties to another country not to become dom domiciled in Malta, then they would uh, really enjoy the system. Um, according to the practice of the, uh, of the inland revenue in Malta, uh, place of as I said, the place of uh, domicile is usually defined the same way um, as in the United Kingdom, usually defining whether it's domicile of origin, dependence of cho and choice, and then we get into varieties. But at the end, the system seems quite clear. If you move to Malta, even for 10 years, but you keep your, your, your relations back at home and, uh, and you do not cut your ties and so on and so on, the same way as in the UK, then you will not be domiciled in Malta. And then the same rules as it was in the United Kingdom, let's say, six or seven years ago, tax rules would still apply. So what are the main benefits? Um, uh, usually when we are talking about the non-DOM uh, system, then the main advantage is taxation, as the same way as in the UK, then a uh, person who is ordinary resident in Malta even could spend 365 days. But non-domicile in Malta is uh, taxable only on uh, on the uh, is not taxable on the on the income arising outside of Malta only if it is remitted to uh, to Malta remitted or received in Malta. Therefore, obviously, the uh, the income earned in Malta is, for example, from property uh, uh, property rental fees and so on and so on is fully taxable there. Um, we also need to take into consideration two things when we are talking about drawbacks. One is the advantage of the double tax treaties, which clearly define where certain income should be taxed, even though the money is remitted to Malta, it cannot be taxed in Malta, even though it's remitted. But also we have to always check the, the limitation, as, as it was said before, of the double tax treaties of uh, whether such non domiciled person could really enjoy the tax benefit, tax treaty benefits if they are coming from a uh, from a high-tech country, let's say Germany, France, and so on and so on. So that is also something important. Um, that is a quite additional advantage of the Malta system, uh, which says that capital gains arising outside of Malta and derived by a person who is either not domiciled or not ordinary resident in Malta, not subject to tax, even if they remit to Malta, which means that if you need a certain, certain kind of income and you see you would be able to use that tax-free in Malta. Uh, the non-DOM system also can be combined with certain residency programs which Malta offers. I do not want to be very, very long on this topic. For example, there are two, two programs, the Malta Global Residence Program, where you could get residency for a minimum annual tax of 15,000 euros. And uh, there is also a tax break for high net worth in the individuals in other residency programs. So you can combine the residency programs with actual tax possibility 
depending on what is your aim, how much time you are spending in which country. So professionally, you have to be a little bit careful of what we would suggest to the clients. We have to explore, obviously, the, the intentions and the actual plans of that client. Um, dividends, uh, based on this rule, are not taxable in Malta if they are not remitted to Malta. But that is that applies, obviously, only to non-Malti source of dividends. Uh, dividends coming from Maltese companies obviously are considered as local income and would be fully taxable uh, at, as a normal personal income tax rate, which just as an example for a single individual uh, who is earning between 19,000 and 60,000 euros is 25 percent and then at the uh, above 60,000 euros it is 35 percent. So the tax burden in a sense is quite big uh, and therefore you have to be very very careful. Uh, the same applies to interest income, which is also taxed on a remittance basis, but resident individuals may choose a 15% withholding tax on bank interest. Um, that is also usually a question of what to do with property income, property rental income, leasing, uh, leasing income. Generally, if the, amount, uh, the, uh, if the amount is coming from a Maltese property, then obviously it is taxed as part of the ordinary income with ordinary tax rates. And also a 15% withholding tax can be chosen, which is based on the gross income. So you cannot deduct costs concerning the rental in this respect. Um, we, with the changes in the United Kingdom, uh, it is an interesting question which came up that, uh, that what would happen if some country would, would simply just stop the non-DOM system, which in Malta, I do not think that would happen so easily. Because I said since 1964, and before that, that was a normal part of the tax system there, which means that to abolish it fully, um, I do not foresee that that would be the case. So all in all, on a long-term basis, I can I think people can rely on something which is integral to the uh, to the to the system. Obviously, if some something happens and this non-dom system of taxation is somehow abolished, then people uh, would revert to full worldwide taxation with certain tax advantages. But then. There would be no sense in moving to Malta for that specific purpose. Um, thankfully, Malta, the anti-abuse system is not as strong as in many other countries uh, yet, obviously. And for example, uh, the controlled foreign corporation income will not be the, the, the CFC legislation is not really used in Malta, which means that structuring international income coming from low tax jurisdiction is easier in Malta than maybe in other countries which have a special tax system where it is understandable why they do not like uh, income coming from um, non-tax uh, sources to be tax-free in the receiving country, like in Portugal, as I understood correctly, maybe now. Uh, transfer pricing is usually not a question. The common reporting standards and, and automatic information exchange is, is usually, obviously, is part of it. Although when the non-DOM system uh, is used and uh, information is sent from foreign tax authorities or foreign banks to the Maltese authorities, then obviously there will be no tax consequences if everything is properly done. So all in all, that is really not a question for people who is a non-dom in Malta, and even though they can be resident, which means that ordinary resident also. So all in all, they, can, uh, they, they would be able to register their tax residency in the bank, then the information would be still provided to the Maltese tax authorities without any, any additional tax liability. Um, I think that the non-DOM concept is really is intact so far and, uh, and uh, also what is important that tax planning with the use of the non-DOM and uh, non-DOM status and certain tax advantages, even though there is a general anti-abuse rule in Malta, they are not part of this uh, anti-abuse rules. So you could use the non-DOM system to your international tax planning freely without any kind of accusation that you are abusing the system. Um, also, another question came up that, that, that what would happen if the UK um, uh, would simply change its tax system and so on. I think that the, the, the previous changes in the UK uh, non-DOM system in the last six or seven years, if I remember correctly, or the minimum manual payment, uh, the suspension of the new changes because of the elections created some kind of um, um, insecurity, especially after Brexit came or what would happen. Therefore, we see a considerable increase in inquiries uh, from people who are just simply investigate that which other countries which have basically the same legal system as the United Kingdom, which would give them um, not too much work to investigate 
uh, legally, whether the situation would change too much if they move to Malta. Ireland, by the way, is an interesting country because according to my knowledge, Ireland also have the same kind of tax system, but somehow, for whatever reason, I don't know why, but somehow it is naturally advertised as it is and naturally pushed the same way as professionals are usually introducing those possibilities. Um, I think that uh, that the UK, when they started to turn the screw step by step on the on the participants, is on a, on a not very very good route, and I can also understand why societies where you have to reach the rich people because they have they have the means available and they have to pay the fair share uh, fair share of, of of the burden and so on. This is not a question yet in Malta, so that is another advantage if somebody would like to move, for example, from the United Kingdom um, to the United Kingdom. But I hope that let's say cooler heads would prevail um, in these matters also and it will not be something which would be a very very populist uh, policy uh, from the tax um, uh, from the tax authorities um, I think in the Euro in the European Union I do not want to consider it as a kind of a beauty contention between the participants I think that Malta is, 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 is quite strong especially with the addition of financial services where people are thinking of moving their stuff from London for understandable reasons, which is the place where you could relocate them and which is the place also which could offer favorable tax situation for them. So that is also another aspect of Brexit that quite a lot of financial companies are considering not just Luxembourg, not just Ireland, not just Frankfurt, but also Malta as a place of business and also the weather, like in Portugal, is quite good if they would like to move lots of people. I think they would be quite happy to leave there. Um, there is a tendency to reduce corporate taxes, taxes all over the world and with Malta having a high 35% corporate tax rate uh, with the imputation possibilities also existing but that is not a topic for today's, uh, today's webinar um, I would say um, yes there is a, a race decreasing the, the tax rates and if the tax rates will not be the same and the definition of the tax base will not be the same all over the world and still there would be always possibilities. There would be countries which would be able to offer certain incentives, whether they are personal income tax incentives like the non-habitual regime in, in Portugal, the Cyprus system which are, which are fairly new. So all those countries would offer certain kind of advantages to foreign investors to get a little bit of uh, a part from the pie. So that's why I think that, that the that these, these attacks and these, these, these problems will not be really affecting uh, countries and international tax planning because the possibilities like the London system, using it for people from coming out of the United Kingdom and coming to Malta would still exist in a way that good professionals uh, like our colleagues here would be able to definitely give good advice and good suggestions to the clients if they inquire of what to do in this respect. Uh, Basically, this is what I would like wanted to talk about, Marta, so I'm open to questions. Laszlo, thank you very much for this useful summary. You're right, it does, uh, it does remind me of the UK's regime a lot, with the only large exemption, uh, exclusion, that the apparently capital gains are not subject to tax in Malta, even if remitted. Presumably, if you have a company, if you have a company resident in a country which does not does not impose taxation on partial liquidation of certain share classes such as in Luxembourg. You could convert your dividends into capital gains and then bring them to Malta without any, without any taxation. And in the absence of uh, uh, anti-avoidance rules in Malta, I think this will succeed. I think that I've, I'm not so familiar with the Luxembourg-Malta Treaty as much. I, I have to check whether that exists or not. But yes, those kind of liquidation, transformation of one type of income into another one, yes, that is always a valid possibility and considerable savings can be accrued. So I think, yes, that is a, that is a good solution for that, yes. And another important, uh, another important difference with the Italian and with the Portuguese regime is that there is a concept of uh, pre-arrival income or gains or clean capital. Essentially, if you want to leave off your foreign uh, income or gains before you, when you move to Malta, you have to uh, cleanse your funds, create clean capital in the same way as in the UK. Laszlo, thank you very much. Now I'm passing the floor to Demis. Uh, the the non-dom regime in Cyprus has existed for some time, I think for as long as it has existed in Malta, but I think the Cyprus regime has been more, uh, has been 
better known to people. So Demis, please tell us all you know. Thank you. Mede, thank you very much. And uh, I would like to thank everybody for their time to be here with us. Uh, yeah, I would just uh, start, uh, I mean, uh, a quick introduction about uh, the non-DOM. Uh, I mean, in general principle, international tax, there are only two ways. And uh, that is uh, countries that tax you because of you are resident or because you have source in a jurisdiction. This non-DOM is, uh, is, a, is a taxation, uh, in my view, uh, from Cyprus perspective, that um, you avoid the taxation of residents. What I mean by that, in Cyprus, if you are resident, uh, you, you are excluded from income tax on dividends and interest. And then you are taxed in a different legislation, which is called uh, SDC, Special Contribution for Defense. This only applies for, for residents. So um, introducing a non-DOM concept, which is simple, uh, we like in Cyprus to, to keep things simple, I'm, I'm lucky for that, <laughs> happy, uh, is that uh, they're saying that if you are a non-DOM in Cyprus, you are excluded from this SDC. So first exclusion is that uh, dividends and interest are excluded from the income tax. You are taxing a parallel, I call it taxation, which is the SDC. And then again, when you fall under the SDC law, uh, if you are a non-domicile, you are exempt there as well. So there is no taxation for non-domicile people on, on dividends and interest. For renters, I will speak later on. Uh, so what is a non-domicile? I think it's better to, to, to explain this by saying, what is a domicile in Cyprus? Domicile person in Cyprus is someone that at the day that he, he was born, his father was a domicile in Cyprus. That's the uh, main criteria that we have in Cyprus. So obviously, the opposite. Uh, is, is the non-DOM. Uh, so again, it's a, it's a, fair, it's a very simply uh, way to, to understand who is non-domicile and who is domicile. Um, uh, so uh, following to, to the benefits of this, if you, are, if you come into to, to Cyprus and you become tax resident, uh, then you exclude them for, for dividends and interest at all, no condition, there is no um, any condition if you bring the, the money or if you don't bring the money. Um, and then for, for rental, again, you, you are excluded. However, for rental, the, the income tax law, um, there is taxation there which you cannot avoid. So mainly, uh, I would say that um, although can uh, um, the rental income now, specifying rental income, uh, you, could tax, you, you could be taxing income tax and SDC. SDC is only 3%, and that's the only thing that... Uh, you, you are avoiding if you are a non-domicile. So uh, the, the, main, the main benefit is for people that uh, they have dividends and interest uh, worldwide, uh, you, you are not taxing Cyprus. Um, uh, what was the intention? I think it's very important to understand the intention bef behind any, any tax law. The intention of, of the Cyprus government, it was to uh, attract high net worth individuals and also uh, people that they can uh, uh, increase the substance of international companies and in order to do that they needed to find a, a way uh, these people that they are coming not to be taxed uh, uh, worldwide on the SDC law that we had in place. Uh, this law of non-DOM is a 2015 law, is a relatively new new law and um, I can say that uh, it, it is quite, uh, it's one of the most uh, attractive uh, part of, of Cyprus now. Um, uh, so you are resident, you have access to 3D network, Cyprus has a lot of uh, double tax 3Ds and um, you know, some of the very, very good 3Ds uh, uh, with, with some countries and, and therefore you can reduce the source taxation of foreign countries with the double tax uh, 3Ds. Uh, and the avoidance uh, rules in Cyprus for, for non-domicile, uh, there is only one, if you, if you are a non-domicile, you come into Cyprus, you are becoming a Cyprus tax resident. Uh, if you are here uh, 70 years out of uh, last 20, then you are deemed to become a non-domicile, a domicile, and the non-domicile uh, concept doesn't exist for you anymore, and therefore you are taxed as as an as normal domicile person. That's the the only uh, I would say anti avoidance provision. Uh, so I think. Um, uh, there is no anything else to say about non-domicile, but uh, I, I, what I would like to mention is that if you include, uh, if you have in mind the, this non-domicile concept, and if you have in mind that uh, 
um, in, in, in Cyprus selling or, or having or owning a company 100% and that company is selling shares or bonds, which is also excluded, then you can have a company that is excluded from corporation tax, which is 12.5%, and you get the dividends again, which is also excluded. So it's a lot of people that are using this because Cyprus is, is, is very well known that it's, it's a holding company apart from others. Um, uh, regime. Uh, for interest as well, that um, a lot of high net individuals, uh, they were uh, having, for example, bonds in governments or in, in big companies, and uh, by relocating to Cyprus, there is no taxation from the residency part on the source tax, which is the is the is the is the governments or is uh, the companies that uh, they are paying you the interest. Then is is uh, as I said before, the three D two protecting that. Um, I, I, having into mind also that uh, um, there is also when you move to Cyprus uh, and you become you are a non-resident and you become a tax resident, there is uh, an employment income benefit that 50% of your employment income for uh, uh, 10 years um, is excluded. Then there is another benefit for that as well uh, to to be recruited in, in Cyprus, and uh, and finally capital gains, uh, individual or company selling um, uh, shares or, or they are excluded from taxation unless uh, there is a uh, property situated in Cyprus. Uh, uh, having said all this, um, I, I think uh, the non-domicile was added in in order to support people coming to Cyprus uh, and uh, increase the substance because Cyprus companies are, are used a lot in international uh, tax uh, arena. So having a Cyprus company with uh, residents that they don't pay uh, taxation at all for, for, for their dividends or interest, they are having worldwide income, and these people that they are in Cyprus working on the Cyprus companies, there is the exception on, on employment income, uh, create a very nice attractive uh, regime which uh, uh, we see a lot of people uh, would like to, to join it. Right, Demis, thanks so much for this comprehensive review. Cyprus is interesting because uh, not only it seems to be very good for non-DOMs moving there, it is a jurisdiction of choice for many holding companies, both for holding and for trading and for IP exploitation. And presumably if you move there for personal reasons, you can easily uh, manage and control your, your company from Cyprus. And uh, combined with the employment income benefits that you mentioned, for quite a substantial length of time. It would be good for you to be an executive or to bring highly paid executives from abroad. Equally, didn't you mention, Demis, that your capital gains are exempt and not that many people will care about selling their Cyprus property. So you can bring stuff uh, onshore to Cyprus. And of course, the benefits for the special defense contribution, they're massive because uh, the SDC, as you said, is a parallel regime which can really upset your tax strategy. And it's good to know that this regime will apply. Um, now, I think we've heard all the speakers and uh, let me finish our discussion by telling you a bit about the UK's non-DOM regime from which, which, is, which is traditionally comes to mind when someone says res non-DOM. To begin with, uh, what is it to be non-domiciled in the UK? You, a person who is not domiciled is the person who is not, does not have a UK domicile or who does not have a deemed UK domicile, which is a term specific to inheritance tax and I will talk, and I will talk about it in a few uh, minutes. So what does it mean to have a domicile? Why is it important? Well, because it is used to determine the extent of one's liability to income tax, to capital gains tax, and to a certain extent to inheritance tax. Um, the meaning of domicile has been developed over many years by UK courts, and I think it was incorporated in other jurisdictions, perhaps even in Malta, if I'm not, if I'm not wrong. If, you're, if as uh, Laszlo mentioned earlier, because Maltese regime is based on the UK's regimes. Broadly, domicile means an individual's permanent home. However, because it is a question of law and not necessarily of facts, sometimes you can find strange results 
that despite living in the country for many years, you will not have acquired its domicile. In most cases, however, nationality or tax residence do not directly affect the domicile finding. Broadly, there are three kinds of domicile. Domicile of origin, which you acquired birth and which normally passes from father to their children. Domicile of dependency, which is relevant for minor children and for mentally incapable persons. And there's a domicile of choice, where a person, after being, say, UK domicile by origin, moves to a different country and acquires a domicile of choice there. But finally enough, if, say, you were UK domicile and you've acquired a domicile of choice in the United States, and then you decided to leave the States and go, say, to France, you will drop your US domicile of choice and it will revert back to your UK domicile of origin until you will acquire your new domicile of choice in France. And this can be relevant for those uh, who travel extensively and spend extended periods of time uh, in different countries. There are various statutory modifications that essentially make it sometimes easier, sometimes more difficult to acquire or to lose domicile and sometimes to acquire it voluntarily. Speaking from the practical point of view for, to our listeners, if a person is born to parents who were born outside the UK, preferably to parents who are also born outside the UK, in most circumstances they will not have the UK domicile of origin, which effectively makes them non-DOMS, non-UK domiciled. So what's, how does domicile affect your tax situation in the UK? In fact, what's, are there any benefits in being, in being a UK domiciled? Um, there are no such benefits. The only situation where potentially it is relevant is where there are spouses, and uh, one of the spouses has a UK domicile and the other one does it. It imposes certain limitations on uh, the inheritance tax liability. And to avoid such limitations, the non-DOM spouse can elect to be a UK domicile. Otherwise, non-DOM is a very prized status that everybody wants to keep. On its own, domicile is only relevant for the inheritance tax liability. Because if a person is a UK domicile, on their death, their assets around the world are subject to UK's 40% inheritance tax. However, if the person is not domiciled, then if they die, only the assets that they have in the UK are subject to inheritance tax, not their foreign assets. Uh, for many, it comes as a surprise that, how come? I've never lived in the UK. I don't have any relatives there. Yet if I die, my home in Windsor will be subject to inheritance tax. Well, this is how inheritance tax works. There is no way to avoid UK inheritance tax on UK situated assets. So this was only for inheritance tax that uh, domicile is important on its own. For everything else, namely for income tax and for capital gains, we have to combine domicile with residence. So we have to see if the person is UK resident or not in a particular tax year. If, again, if a person is not UK resident, then strictly speaking, domicile plays no role because foreign income will not be subject to tax in the UK due to the non-residency and UK source income will be subject to tax just the same uh, depending on the source of income. However, if the person is not domiciled and UK resident, this is where it becomes interesting. Any income that a person receives in the UK, such as dividends, salary, uh, capital gains, etc., is taxed under the normal rules at source at the regular rates. However, if a non-domiciled person receives income or gains outside of the UK and provided such person does not bring, or the word that we use is remit such income or gains to the UK, you do not have to pay tax on them whatsoever. Um, there are very broad anti avoidance rules which effectively prevent you from enjoying your foreign income or gains in any way possible in the UK without paying tax on them. In other words, no matter what an average client might think of or how they can use their foreign 
money in the UK, it's already been provided for and prohibited. Therefore, the key planning aspect before coming to the UK is making sure that you have enough funds that you can fund your life in the UK. And this is what we call clean capital. Clean capital are income or gains that the person has earned before he becomes a UK resident. Essentially, it means that they sell their assets, they crystallize any gains, they receive the payments of dividends and interest and salaries, and put them in separate bank accounts so that when in the future they receive other income or gains post their arrival, they will not be mixed with such clean capital. Until a couple of years ago, UK non-DOM regime has been a lifelong affair. You could remain non-UK domiciled for as long as you lived, provided that after seven years of living in the UK, you had to make a payment to avoid being taxed on your foreign income or gains. The payment is called the remittance basis charge. The amount of the remittance basis charge is £30,000 after seven years of life in the UK. Essentially, you have to compare what is larger, £30,000 of the charge or the tax that you would pay on your foreign income or gains that you would bring to the UK. Recently, the law increased the £30,000 to £60,000 for those who have lived in the UK for 12 years out of 15 consecutive tax years. And finally, this year, 2017, we're faced with the possibility of the complete abolition of the remittance basis of taxation or the resident dom regime after the person will have been UK resident for 15 continuous tax years. The problem with uh, this year's uh, tax legislation in the UK is that due to the elections coming in July, a large part of the, uh, of the provisions that regulated the application of the resident dom regimes have been carved out. And we're waiting for some significant developments after July. However, such developments will apply starting from 6th of April, which puts us in a bit of a limbo and does not make the clients happy. But well, what can you do? I said before that there are very broad anti-avoidance measures that effectively prevent individuals from enjoying the benefits of their uh, foreign non-remitted income or gains. In practice, this means that neither your wife nor your minor children can enjoy your foreign funds in the UK. You cannot pay for their education, you cannot pay for their restaurants, you cannot let them uh, leave, you cannot let them leave in properties acquired with your unremitted foreign income or gains. Of course, there are ways in which foreign funds can be brought in the UK without triggering, triggering taxation. However, they are quite limited. One such way is the business investment relief. Essentially, it allows you to fund your UK trading company with your foreign source unremitted income or gains. And for as long as this company is using these funds for its own business purposes and you cannot benefit from them, then you're fine. They will not be subject to the remittance uh, taxation. Unfortunately, this, there are not other ways that such foreign funds can be joined in the UK. Whether the remittance basis and the UK's non-DOM regime will terminate in the UK, we really cannot tell. In the past couple of years, we have seen sweeping changes which have made uh, the way that non-DOMs are taxed significantly worse. And uh, maybe in the next five or seven years, maybe the regime will be abolished, who knows? However, I don't think this will be a wise move because those who can afford and for whom it's worth to claim the remittance basis and claim the non-DOM regime, they are mobile and they can easily move to another country, Cyprus, Malta, Italy or Portugal, to benefit from it. With the race to the bottom vis-a-vis -vis the corporation tax, the UK perhaps is the, is the country with the, one of the lowest rates of corporation tax 
amongst the developed countries in Europe. At the moment, the rate is 19%, but it is going down to 17% in 2020. Of course, it cannot be compared with Cyprus's 12.5%, or perhaps with the Maltese rate of 5% effective tax rate. However, we are seeing an increased interest in high net worth individuals moving to the UK, claiming the remittance basis of tax, accepting a slightly higher tax charge, but uh, being happier with the predictability of the uh, UK's uh, company's law, income tax, and the general rule of law, which is all pervasive in this jurisdiction. We are adamant that the UK presents ample planning opportunities for foreign holding companies, which sometimes can uh, uh, be better than in other low tax countries. In summary, UK's remittance basis of taxation available to non-domiciled individuals allows you not to pay UK tax on any foreign income or gains that you do not bring to the UK. Of course, the flip side of this is that you have to think very carefully about the funds that you will use to fund your life while you're living here. And of course, after seven years of life in the UK, the payment of £30,000 per year to benefit from such regime can be rather steep. Hereby, I summarize my presentation. I'm not sure if we have any questions from the audience. Um, no, there are no questions from the audience. Uh, this is Matteo, I'm back in again. <laughs> uh, so, do you guys have any concluding remarks or should we wrap up, given that we're half an hour delayed due to technical uh, reasons? If I may say, if on behalf of the rest of the speakers, I think it would be good to wrap up. I uh, really enjoyed moderating the session. Thank you very much, speakers, and uh, people listening to us. We look forward to sending you the transcripts and the recording. And thank you, Mateo, for organizing it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, all of you. Thank you, Demis, Dimitri, Laszlo, uh, Joao, and Claudio for participating. Again, our apologies for uh, the wrench that go to webinar through uh, in our way, but I think uh, everything uh, went smoothly after uh, we figured out the technical uh, difficulties, and uh, we only added half an hour to uh, to the event. So our apologies for that. Uh, just to get some admin issues out of the way. Um, this uh, event has been recorded. We will have a full transcript. Give us a few weeks to work on those, and we will make sure to uh, send to uh, everyone. Uh, with that said, you know, on behalf of Masha, myself, and TaxLink, thank you very much for participating, and hope you have a great weekend uh, coming up. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Have a good day.